The following satellite transmission, copyrighted by the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, is available for live broadcast in 10 seconds or for taping and rebroadcast by any AM, FM, shortwave, cable, or video outlet globally. This is a WBN Worldwide Broadcasting Network production. This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. Sooner or later, pain comes into every life. Dr. Edward Judson once said, suffering and success go together. If you're succeeding without suffering, it is because others before you have suffered. If you're suffering without succeeding, it is that others after you may succeed. In one of his three-minute dramas, the playwright Thornton Wilder told of a sick doctor who stood one day by the pool of Bethesda, waiting for the water to be troubled, that he might be made whole again. The angel who troubled the water came to him and said, stand back, healing is not for you. Without your wound, where would your power be that sends your voice trembling into the hearts of men? We ourselves, the very angels of God in heaven, cannot persuade the wretched and blundering children of earth, as can one human being broken on the wheels of living. In love's service, only wounded soldiers will do, he wrote. I have not suffered by the South, Abraham Lincoln told a friend of his. I have suffered with the South. And at the moment of their calamity, the survivors of that great ship, the Titanic, when it went down, were not stunned, but as one wrote, we were lifted into an atmosphere of vision where suffering merges into some mystic meaning. We were all one, not only with one another, but with the great cosmic being, God. In your pain, in your suffering, in your problems and perplexities, God is there. God will meet you there and lead you through it if you will but have faith in God. Try, if you are to suffer, to do it splendidly, said Phillips Brooks. And the poet Faber wrote this prayer to God. When obstacles and trials seem like prison walls to be, I do the little I can do and leave the rest to thee, to God. That is the spirit. Much human unhappiness has its origin in your failing to see the larger truth, the larger perspective in your situation. When Sir Robert Hart was a student at Belfast, Ireland, a professor had a packing case brought into the classroom, and he directed his students to describe for him what they saw, and it seemed a simple thing to do. Surely everybody would say essentially the same things about it, he thought, and yet the man on the right described an address written in black letters. The one at the end dwelt on the iron hoops that bound the box. A third was interested in the long nails that studded a corner. Thus, each according to his viewpoint, saw that same commonplace packing box in a different manner. After this practical demonstration, Sir Robert said he never in his life could grow impatient or angry with anyone who didn't see exactly what he saw when they were standing on an opposite side of a question. Said Jesus, judge not that you be not judged. Learn that part of love called tolerance. Professor Rufus Jones wrote, on our planet, all our spiritual truths, all our spiritual realities have to be expressed in temporal, human-changing forms. There have been stagnant centuries which have kept unchanged the crystallized forms which they inherited, and they have supposed that faith would cease to be. If this particular form of truth should vanish away, the Pharisees could not imagine a true religion without circumcision, the blood of bulls and goats. Roman Christians of the 15th century could not believe that real religion would survive if the doctrine of transubstantiation of the Eucharist, the real presence in the bread and the wine, should be given up. Calvinists, some of them supposed that their articles of faith were permanent embodiments of truth and their plan of salvation the only possible one. They all conceived of truth as something which could be expressed once and for all in a form which all coming ages must keep unchanged as well. You might expect to bottle up daylight and preserve it and keep it on a shelf. Truth is never some dead thing which can be laid out. It is living, it is moving, it is quickening, outgrowing its old forms, taking on new expressions, preserving itself as life itself does by endless variations and by nearly infinite embodiments. There are transitions going on in every age. The things that can be shaken are removed. The things that have grown old and crumbled vanish away. These things always bring trial to faith, for it is difficult for most persons to distinguish between the temporary form, that is, the human embodiment, and the eternal abiding truth which lives on in the midst of change and in the midst of vanishing forms of thought. This is the great test of spiritual power and insight. Those who have short vision and a traditional faith build on the temporal and cling to the form which has grown familiar and dear to them. But if anything shakes this form... 
Their faith is shattered. They suffer shipwreck. Those, however, who have real spiritual vision look through the temporal and fleeting, through the transitory forms and embodiments and vocabularies of the time, and settle their hearts and their faith upon eternal reality, the infinite God who abides and works in the midst of and through all changes in history, all changes in your life, all changes in your circumstances. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And you can know God, and God is the source of truth, said Plato. God is truth, and light is his shadow. There's a liberty, a joy, and a hallelujah of hope in your heart when you find and come to know the living God who loves you with a love which will not let you go and calls you to live in love for others, work for harmonious relationships with other people. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. The psalmist wrote, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And George Herbert said, Be calm in arguing, for fierceness makes error a fault and truth discourtesy. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do to others as you would have them do to you. God loves you. Love everyone else and love God and worship God. It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Live in love for God and others. The two great commandments. There's an old Kansas proverb, When one will not, two cannot quarrel. There's guidance for your life. There's help and hope for you. In his book, Mountains in the Mist, F.H. Borham wrote these words, May I draw upon my memory just after I settled in my New Zealand home. It was my great privilege to entertain one of the most gifted of our professors, and I felt it to be a priceless opportunity. I sought his counsel concerning all of my early difficulties in life, and one morning we were sitting together on the veranda, looking away across the golden plains to the purple and sunlit mountains. When I broached to him this deep and important question. Can a man be sure, I mean quite sure, really sure, I asked him, that in the hour of perplexity and doubt and uncertainty, he will be rightly led by God? Can he feel secure against taking a false step in that moment? The man replied, I'm certain of that. I'm certain of it if he will but give God time. Remember that as long as you live, he added entreatingly. Those three words, listen to them. Give God time. Give God time. Dr. Jowett said he was once in the most pitiful perplexity. He consulted his friend, Dr. Berry. What would you do if you were in my place, in my situation, he entreated. I don't know, Jowett, Dr. Berry said. I'm not in your situation, and you are not there yet. When do you have to act? When do you have to make your decision? Dr. Jowett replied, I have to make the decision on Friday. Then, answered Dr. Berry, you will find your way clear on Friday. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but by the time you have to act, you'll find the way clear. God will not fail you. And surely enough, on Friday, all was plain to me. He said, the guidance of God is real. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and you will receive. However difficult it may be to see the gleam leading on through the gloom, it is never difficult on looking back to see that you have been led, a brilliant essayist. Said John Wesley was being trained for his mission on earth long before he appeared upon this planet. The high faith of his father, the Puritan strain, and the wonderful mother were these not master elements in the forming of John Wesley's soul. Early the kindly light was leading. Sir W. Robertson Nicole affirms that very few old men and old women look back with regret upon the decisions they made at the crises of their careers. The meaning of it is this, he said, that we are not left so much on our own as we might think. Unconsciously to ourselves, we have been guided. God has a will for you and a fragment of infinity indwelling your mind to lead you, to guide you. A British writer, Mark Rutherford, wrote in one of his books how on holidays the boys in a small English village would go trudging three miles down to the main coach road just to read the captivating words on that signpost there. The words were, to London, to York. What marvelous thoughts those magic words evoked. The romance of the mysterious fingers pointing mutely down the winding road along which the coaches rattled on their way to the great capitals was an opening into infinity. For those of us who were boys at that time, he wrote, so it is that God calls you to a distant destiny which you may not now comprehend. You may not understand it, but 
deep in your heart, in your soul of souls, you know that it's there and you know that it's true. And one day you shall find it. If you will prepare yourself and prepare yourself and prepare, as Lincoln said, one day you shall be ready for what God has called you to do. And God has called you to the kingdom for such an hour as this. This is your time. This is your life. This is your generation. This is your moment upon this planet. And there are things which you can do. You may not be famous, may not be well-known, may not think of yourself as particularly educated or intelligent or powerful or resourceful or resolved or dedicated or determined. And yet there are things on this earth at this time which you can do, which you can accomplish, which you can achieve, which no other person on this planet in this hour can do. God has called you to his kingdom for such an hour as this. And if you will give your life to God, you will discover firsthand and resoundingly the living truth and the exhilarating joy of that. Then write to us, will you? At the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, there's a reason for your life. And haven't you always felt it? Haven't you always really known it inside? There's a reason for your existence. God has a will for you. I've written free literature on the spiritual life. On these very things, yours without cost, charge, or obligation, when you write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, The Fatherhood of God, The Brotherhood of Man, Life After Death, What Happens to You When You Die, What Lies Beyond. All of this, yours with no cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that mailing address, Box 3080 Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.